Let's make some noise right now for everybody watching on the live stream right now, everybody watching from YouTube and Facebook and Overflow again. It's good to see you. Um, we want to encourage you to leave a comment, let us know where you're watching from, or hit the share button because you never know who might be in need of this message today. If you guys have your Bible, we're going to open in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. We're beginning a brand new series here called Love Lessons. How many of you know our world needs lessons in love? That's for sure. Um, one person agrees with me on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over the next four weeks, we're going to take a look at four biblical relationships, and we're going to extract lessons, good and bad, out of their life and learn lessons from how God orchestrated their relationship that I believe will be applicable and life-changing to us today. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, we're going to start with the relationship, the original relationship with Adam and Eve. The Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat from the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone, so I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals, all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and while the man slept, the Lord God took out of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. And the Lord God made woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Genesis chapter 2. I pray that today we would not go through the motions of our faith today, but we would lean in with hopeful expectation that you're going to meet us right where we are. You're going to speak life and truth and power. Mold us, shape us like the potter molds and shapes the clay. Be strong in my weakness. I need you. It is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. The first thing I want to show you out of this text from Genesis chapter 2 is your most important relationship is with God. Your most, I'm going to say it one more time, your most important relationship is with God. I know everybody thinks it's all about my wife, my husband, whoever it is, but the reality is there is no more important relationship than your relationship with the Father, and it really serves as the foundation for all of the relationships that you will have. I want you to notice that in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible tells us that God and Adam walked together before Adam walked with Eve. I'm going to say it this way. Adam walked with God long before he walked with Eve. I know a lot of times when we think of the creation story, we imagine Adam and Eve being created simultaneously and them just existing together and coexisting together at the same time. But reality shows us that man was created first and Adam had a relationship with God before he had a relationship with Eve. This is setting a spiritual precedence for us all that not only is our most important relationship to be that of God, but we must walk with him long before we look for a spouse. God is the author of life. He is the giver of every good and perfect thing. In relationship with him is where we discover our true identity, our value, our security, our position, and the purpose for our life. It is found in a relationship with him. When we walk with God, that is what prepares us and equips us to walk and love our spouse like we are called to. 
I hear so many people say, well, I don't know how to walk with God. I don't know how to have a relationship with God. He is invisible. He doesn't speak to me. So how am I supposed to have a relationship with somebody I can't see or hear? And I'm glad you asked. The reality is the Bible tells us that we have a relationship with God through his written word. The Bible is not just a book. It is a library of books. It is the spoken word of the living God. And when you cannot hear God in your life, you can always turn to the word and read God. God is always speaking. The question is, are you listening? God has spoken. And it is in his word, his character, his person, his attributes are all revealed through the word of God. We walk with God when we read his word. We walk with God when we pray. And by the way, prayer is not like just a laundry list of things that you need God to do for you. So many people think that prayer is a one-sided affair. Prayer is a communication between you and the Father. You, yes, you make your petition known to him, but then you listen. You listen. Let his word resonate inside of you. Too many of us, we, our prayer life looks like us just listing off everything we get, need God to do for us right now. And then we're like, amen, see you later, God. But imagine if your relationship with your spouse was only one-sided. All you did was tell them what you needed, but you never stopped to listen. Prayer is a two-way communication. We must speak, but we also must listen. We also walk with God through praise and worship and the fellowship of the saints. In community, God edifies and encourages us through his body and in praise and worship. So how do we walk with God? We read his word, we pray, we worship, and we stay connected to the body of Christ. That's how we stay connected. As we are connected to him, he corrects us, rebukes us, and challenges us. All the while, he's equipping us more and more to love like he loves. If God is your first love, you can't help but be just a little bit more loving, a little bit more merciful, a little bit more gracious. Galatians chapter 5, 22 tells us that the, what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and faithfulness. These are the fruits of the Spirit. If you are walking with God, these are going to be evident in your life. And these are necessary in order to love your spouse or your fiance or whoever it is like God has called you to love them. Jesus said in John chapter 15, he said, I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. If you abide in me, you will be fruitful and very fruitful. In other words, the more I read the word and the word gets into my soul, the more I pray and intercede, my heart becomes in line with his. The more I worship and praise him and take my distractions, my eyes off the distractions of the world and set my eyes on the things above, what begins to flow from my life is the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. In relationship with the father, you can't help but be a better husband. In relationship with the Father, you can't help but be just a little bit better of a wife. Can I get a witness if anybody believes what I'm saying today? If you are connected to the source, you will be fruitful. And by the way, fruit is always for the benefit of others. I've never seen a tree eat its own fruit. Have you? And by the way, a fruit who produces, a tree who produces fruit for the benefit and nourishment of others that fruit also multiplies. It has the seed in it to be a blessing over and over again. Be connected to Jesus. The next thing I want to show you is you cannot allow your priorities to get out of alignment. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to be in alignment. Remember, I told you the most important relationship you will ever have is not with your wife. It's with God Almighty. There is an order to how life is meant to be lived, and we see it clearly over and over again throughout Scripture. Here it is. 
You ready? Here's the alignment. Number one, God should be the top priority of your life. Number two should be your spouse. Number three should be your kids. Number four should be your family. Number five should be your ministry. And number six should be your career. That's the order. But let's just focus on the first three for a minute. Because if you can get the first three right, man, that's a game changer. God, if he's not first in your life, if he is not your prized possession, if he's not the one you love more than anything, then you have fallen into idolatry. I'm just going to tell you like it is. It's just the way it is. If you love a girl, you love a guy, you love your wife, you love your children, you love your dog or golf or the Carolina Panthers more than you love God, you are an idolater. I'm just going to tell you like it is. But how, let, me, let me tell you something. I don't want to condemn you with that because there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. If you're struggling with loving God like you ought to, be honest and be vulnerable in your prayer life. Say to God, I don't love you like I need to love you. I, I don't worship you and spend time with you like I need to. I know you're greater than my heart feels right now. Help me, Lord, to love you more. Help me, God, to put you first in my life. When you're vulnerable and you're open with him, he responds to vulnerable prayers. He, he absolutely does. But you've got to get your life in alignment. God has to be first. If your life is not in alignment, not only can you become an idolater, but it also creates dysfunction. Confusion, frustration ensues. I believe that a great deal of your marital issues that you're facing today, not all, but many of them, can be resolved just by you setting your life into proper alignment. Because see, in marriages all over the world, we maybe have God first, but then the children, the baby is second. And I'll do anything for my child, but my husband, you can do your own thing, all right? Like, or my wife, right? How, this is one of the great fallacies that many of us, even in the Christian world, we fall into. We prioritize our children above our spouse. It creates dysfunction. We are out of alignment, and this is not how we're called to live. You cannot let your children come between you and your spouse. You and your spouse. That's the closest, tightest human relationship you should have. If you get these things in alignment, I promise you, your life will function in a healthy and beautiful way. Now, listen, I got to tell you something. Life on planet Earth defaults to dysfunction and chaos. Everything on Earth defaults to chaos. Some of you are like, I don't believe you, preacher. Okay, well, how about this? Neglect your backyard for like a month and see what happens. I've done it before, Lord save me. Um, and the weeds take over and the little demon snakes all over the place. And it just like, it doesn't take long. If you neglect your landscaping, it's gonna default to chaos and dysfunction. How about this? You neglect your car. You don't change the oil. You're welcome. Somebody just remembered to change the oil in their car. You're welcome, all right? You don't change your oil. You don't put gas in it. You don't maintain your car. What does it default to? Perfection? dysfunction. Here's the reality. Relationships don't accidentally function and flourish and thrive. They do so intentionally when we get them in the right alignment and in the right order. You cannot neglect your relationship with God and expect it to flourish and you to be fruitful in your life. You can't neglect your partner and expect everything to be awesome and like a fairy tale in the end. Relationships are require intentional investment and sacrifice. Your marriage is not going to accidentally be awesome because everything in earth defaults to chaos and disorder. You've got to pay attention. You've got to be proactive and you've got to make investments in your marriage. Can I get a witness of anybody that believes the words coming out of my mouth today? Earth defaults to chaos. It truly does. Now, the next thing I want to show you out of Genesis 2 is that you've got to become the one before you find the one. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to be the one. Let's get a little, little attitude. you got to be the one. In Genesis chapter 2, God prepared Adam for Eve. When we're in our single stage of life, 
We're just out here scouting and hustling and just looking around. We're just surveying everybody, looking at the crowd, you know, who liked my picture. Um, But the truth is we get so hyper-focused on finding the one that we lose sight of what God is trying to do in our life. And the truth is God is trying to make you into the one, and then he'll bring the one. So here's an example of this. God gave Adam a job. Two of them. I cannot tell you how many young men I've talked to that want a wife, but don't want a job. They want a wife, but they don't want to hold down a steady career. They don't want to be faithful. They just want, to, they just want their blessing. Well, listen, before God's going to send you the one, he's not going to st- send you something you can't steward and handle. If you can't hold down a job, you definitely can't hold down a marriage. You see, before Adam was introduced to Eve, God first gave him a job and two of them. Look at Genesis 2 again. All the men are like, I hate this sermon. Um, (laughs) Look at it again. Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says that God made Adam a gardener. He was a gardener and he was a zoologist. He named all the animals as they came back and forth, right? So the zoologist, that was his side hustle, but he was really a gardener, okay? Okay. So DoorDash, you know, do your thing, man. You, you got to have a side hustle. And in all seriousness, though, the gardening and the zoology, it was all a way of providing and taking care of his bride-to-be. She ate from that garden. She drank from the milk from the cattle. It was all in preparation. God was focused on Adam becoming the one before he sent the one. Everybody wants a wife, but do you want a job? Do you want to be faithful? Are you interested in becoming the one? Now, I got to show you something else. This is, hilar- is low-key hilarious. And God, this just shows you a little bit of God's personality. God prolonged Adam's singleness. Like, look at it again in Genesis 2. Watch this. God himself observed that it is not good for man to be And then immediately following that statement from God, he creates the animals and parades them in front of Adam to name them. I'm serious. Look at the Bible again. See, we think that verse, it's not good for man to be a follower, or it's not good for man to be alone, help me preach the Bible, um, is followed up by immediately God creating Eve. Wrong. Immediately after that observation, God created the animals and they walked all over in front of Adam and he named each one. How many of you know there's a lot of animals So God actually prolonged his singleness. God was not surprised, caught off guard. Oops, you mean none of these, the pelican won't work for you, Adam? Like God was not surprised by that. Um, God prolonged his single stage because God was still working on Adam. In fact, here's the real takeaway. God wanted to make sure Adam loved him more than any companion he would bring into his life. Because until God is enough for you, No man or woman ever will be. You've got to love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. You've got to be content with who he is. And by the way, singleness is not of the devil. In fact, singleness is a gift. These are precious moments that God has given you. Some of you, singleness is your calling for your lifetime. And some of you, it's calling for a season. But don't waste this moment. God is preparing you. He's using you. He's getting you ready. Now, I've got to show you something else that's amazing here. When God paraded the animals in front of Adam, he created them male and female. It looked like Noah's Ark out there. Like, they were in pairs. Like, in other words, everybody had somebody but Adam. The giraffe had somebody. The sloth had somebody. Even the skunk had somebody. Everybody had somebody but Adam. Anybody feel like Adam today? It's like everybody's got somebody but me. Don't be, don't be comparing your life to everybody else's. Be content with who you are. Be content with where you are. And be content that God is enough for me. If God never answers another prayer, I pray he is more than enough for me. If God never does another thing I want him to do, I'm still going to worship him. I'm still going to praise him. Because the greatest relationship I'll ever have is already mine in with the Father. Is this helping anybody today? 
you got to become the one before you find the one. Now, I'm about to get all up in your face right now. Look at your neighbor and say, buckle up. Because I'm coming for you. We think that marriage changes things. We think more specifically, more precisely, we think marriage changes people. Let me help you. A ring and a ceremony does not make you a wife. A ring and a ceremony doesn't make you a husband. No, you got to become that. You got to become a wife before you get married. You got to become a husband before you get married. You got to have character. You got to be faithful, integrity. You got to walk righteously before the Lord before he brings them into your life. A ring won't change you automatically into something else. Marriage doesn't change you. It only exposes you for who you really are. Oh, I'm preaching now. I really am preaching to you now. See, ladies, you're like, well, I know he cheated on me when we were dating, but you know, it was just because it was long distance. When we're married, when we're together, he's going to be faithful. No, he won't. Because marriage doesn't change people. Only Jesus changes people. Only Jesus changes people. And men, I'm going to talk to you for a minute because you, you got it easy for a second there. Men think, well, my lust problem, it'll go away once I get married. Been looking at pornography. You're addicted to it. You just got real awkward in here, but I'm fine. It's funny, you know it is. We're addicted to it, and we think that, well, you know, when I get married, that lust problem will go away. No, it won't. Because you'll be married and addicted. And now you'll still be lusting after another woman, which is adultery, adultery in your own marriage. The giants that you ignore right now in your single stage, you will face them again in your promise. Oh, I'm preaching to you now. The giants you ignore today, they will occupy your promise. You got to drive out the enemy. You got to give it over to God today. You got to let Him change the appetite of your heart, change the desires to set you free. He can do it. Pray this prayer Lord, help me to love what you love and hate what you hate. Help me to take the taste of lust out of my mouth. Help me, Lord, to only love what is righteous, holy, pure, and true. And God will do it. He is faithful. The Holy Spirit can change your desires. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. You got to give it to him now. What you allow right here in this stage, you're going to have to face it again. It's time to become the one before you find the one. The next thing I want to show you really quickly is you got to rely on God to bring you your spouse. You got to rely on God. I'm going to say it again. Rely on him. Not rely on Tinder, Christian mingle, farmers only. <laughs> like, I'm from West Virginia. No, um, we're relying on God to bring us our spouse. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. What did, that, what did we just read? And he brought her to him. God brought her. In the right time. There's a spiritual principle that I need you to receive. It's found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. It says this. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and he will supply your every need. I'm going to read it to you. Don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Verse 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Isn't that an amazing verse? And by the way, that is in the context of relational Needs. He will provide for you whatever you need. It's amazing. If you seek God, you pursue God one day in pursuit of him, you're going to look up 
and there she will be, or there he will be. You, go, you keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep your eyes on the most important relationship, and he will make you into the one, and one day he will bring you the one. Now, just a side note, just a side note for clarity. This doesn't mean you sit back and do nothing. Like, you still, men, have to talk. <laughs> You still have to invite her to go to coffee or something. You have to open your mouth. You can't just say, well, I'm relying on God. I'm 83, and I'm still relying on God. Okay, look, some point you got to open up your mouth. But what I'm trying to tell you is nothing wrong with the 83-year-olds. Hey, young at heart, I love it. But look, hopefully you found somebody by now. But if that was your calling. Um, what I'm trying to tell you is we rely on God, but we are proactive as well. And, that, and it's possible. It is 100% possible. And by the way, who you marry is the second most important decision you will ever make in your lifetime behind your decision to follow Jesus Christ. That's the most important decision. And now for the part that you've all been waiting for. You cannot be unequally yoked. All the people in the YouTube stratosphere are going to hate me for this. They hate it every time I say it. Here it is again, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. This, this is the word of God, not my opinion. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion does light have with darkness? And what accord does Christ have with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Plain English. Believers do not date or marry unbelievers. The living don't date the dead. Spiritually. You say, well, that sounds a little bit archaic. Well, let me help you understand it. This was written to an agricultural society, talking about yoked, being uneven, unequally yoked. A yoke is a wooden harness that was put along the shoulder blades of two oxen. And ideally, farmers would put that yoke between two oxen that are similar in size, similar in strength, so that they would lighten the burden and pull straight in the same direction. But the problem is, if a farmer ever put a strong ox beside a weak ox, what would happen is, instead of the plow going straight, the plow would go off in a circle. And before you knew it, they were unfruitful, and the oxen were pulling in opposite directions. You cannot be unequally yoked and arrive at your purpose and be the man and woman you were called and destined to be. It's you got to walk in harmony and unison together. Plain English, let me tell you something. If you believe this book, you believe the Bible, here's what it says. In Christ, former things pass away and all things are made new. You are a new creation in him, which means you don't see sin the same way. You don't see money, life, sacrifice, raising a family through the same lens and perspective. In Christ, you have been changed. You are a new creation. They don't see life the way you see life. And they never will until they taste and see of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Now, what about those who you guys got married when you were both unbelievers and now want to use a believer and the other one still rejecting Christ? Well, the Bible actually addresses you perfectly. It says, do not get a divorce and be like, peace out, homie. You're, you're a heathen. We're unequally yoked. No, you're in that thing because marriage is for a lifetime. But here's what it says. It speaks specifically to women. It says, women, you should conduct yourself and live in such a way that without even speaking a word, your actions would portray the gospel to him. That through your actions, through your life, through your mercy, through your forgiveness, through your faithfulness, that he would see the gospel in action through your life and that you would win him to Christ. You're a soul winner. Congratulations. If you're married to an unbeliever, you now are a soul winner. This is the word of the Lord. Continuing on in Genesis chapter 2. Godly relationships start with sacrifice. Look at your neighbor, help me preach, say it starts with sacrifice. This is incredible. This is incredible. 
When God made man, he formed man from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed the breath of life into man, and he became a living being. Man, we were men, we were made from the dirt, but women, they weren't made from the dirt. They're clean, they're fresh. They were made from Adam's rib. In other words, God took away Adam's rib, and from it, he created and gave life to Eve. This is a symbol, this is a message right here in plain sight that the first relationship began with the sacrifice of Adam. You see it. He had to give up his rib in order to get a wife. True, healthy, biblical relationships flourish through sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus, through his words, tells, tells us this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. These are the words of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul to Ephesians. Love your wives like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Well, he climbed up on a rugged cross and died for her. It's the picture of sacrifice. Listen, lasting, beautiful, godly marriages are not an accident. They're not a coincidence. It wasn't because two super compatible people just lucked out and found each other. No, it's because two people have committed to loving one another sacrificially for the rest of their lives. Marriages are built on sacrifice. They are. And God commissions the husbands to take the initiative. You go first. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. Give of yourself for her. Do you realize that sacrifice is one of the highest expressions of love the world has ever known. Scripture says it this way, what greater love is there than this, than a man who would lay down his life for his friend? It says there's no greater love than this. There's no higher expression of your love towards your spouse than when you sacrifice for them. Can I get a witness to anybody that believes it? My wife, Christina, who's here today, hi, hi beautiful, um, she flourishes when I sacrifice. The truth is, um, things that she loves to do are not always the same things I love to do, and the things I love to do, she doesn't love to do, and my wife loves to take trips. She really does. She loves trips. Is it true? It's true. She loves trips. They don't have to be fancy. They just have to be out of Charlotte, okay? She loves Charlotte. They just got to be out of Charlotte, okay? I'm more bougie than she is. That's true. I know you, that's true. Okay, anyway, um, I don't like trips. I like to work. In fact, I love what I do, and I want to work every single day. It's unhealthy. Don't do it. Don't, I'm just, but I'm telling you me, all right? If I'm on the beach for like two days, I'm reaching for the laptop. I'm like, come on, somebody send me an email. Somebody text me something. We got to get something going. We got to, because like I, I flourish like in productivity and progress. I don't want to like just lay there, okay? But the truth is, the truth is, is that we are called to sacrifice for one another. The truth is, she does so many things for me that are sacrificial, that are beautiful, that express her love towards me. The least that I can do is be intentional, and I got to do a better job. I got to do, I'm going to be first one to tell you, I got to do a better job of prioritizing my wife, loving her well, and sacrificing what I want and what I think and what I enjoy for what she enjoys. And by the way, men, if you do it and you complain about it, you just disqualified the work you just did. If you're like, the only reason I'm here is because you like it, and you just ruined the whole thing. Just smile, be happy, love her. She'll see the pain in your eyes. Just, you don't have to say a word. <laughs> just love her well. But the truth, but honestly, truthfully, if I do anything, any, it doesn't have to be a trip, anything that's sacrificial for my wife, she truly flourishes. She opens up. It, it's, a, it's just how it works. Love and marriage truly is built on sacrifice. And I gotta show you one more thing that's absolutely amazing about this point. Did you know that the human rib cage is the only, that's the only bone in your body that can regenerate itself, that can grow back. I did not know that until I was studying for this sermon, but literally doctors, orthopedic surgeons, they will literally take 
part of your rib cage, if they're going to do some kind of reconstructive surgery, they'll take, they'll take that bone out because it is the only bone in the human body that can regenerate itself, regrow back. In other words, there's a message here. God is showing you something. You think that when you sacrifice your ribs so you can get a wife, you think that when you sacrifice, it's going to leave you empty? You think that when you sacrifice, it's going to really hurt and be painful? But the truth is, is that when you sacrifice, God will restore to you everything you've lost. And Adam may have had to give up a rib, but he gained a wife. Anything God commands you to lay down, he has something far better in store to restore unto you. Adam didn't live the rest of his life with one rib cage, though the Lord restored to him everything that was lost. You think you're going to lose, you're not. You're going to flourish in sacrifice. Is this not the word of the living God? It is the word of God. And by the way, Matthew Henry, a famous commentator, said woman was not made out of rib um, for, for just any reason. She was not made from his head to be above him. She was not made from his feet to be beneath him. But she was made from his rib to be an equal beside him, to be under his arm protection, and to be his beloved. It's incredible. Amazing. I'm not going to preach much longer. Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. You've got to take responsibility for your actions. Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. The man replied, it was the woman you gave me that gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. We'll stop right there. So after they sinned, the Lord came and spoke to Adam. And Adam was like, it was her fault. It was the woman you gave me. And then the Lord turned to Eve, and she's like, it was a serpent. It was his fault. Everybody's shifting the blame. The truth is, this is a sign of spiritual immaturity when you are constantly blaming your partner for everything that went wrong. Spiritual maturity is taking ownership and responsibility for the things that you did that were sinful. And side note, Adam should have taken responsibility for the sin of his wife because Scripture records God told Adam don't eat from that tree. It never says God told Eve. So, ladies, that's for your ammo, okay? You, the next time he says, well, where would we be if it weren't for women? Still in the garden, okay? Fire back. <laughs> Fire back with, yeah, but he, God told you and you didn't tell us. That's funny and you know it is. Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You gotta be, you gotta be honest. You cannot be a victim, passing the blame. You gotta be spiritually mature and take ownership and responsibility for the things that you've done wrong. You wanna help solve the argument? You wanna overcome and walk in peace? Then take responsibility for what you've done. Be honest, be vulnerable. In closing today, I want to show you the gospel in the garden. In case you missed last week, I made a point that if you have difficulty understanding the Old Testament, there's one key that will help you unlock it. Look for Jesus in the Old Testament. Look for Jesus in every story, every chapter, every character. Look for him because if you look hard enough, you'll find him. Jesus is the key that unlocks the Old Testament because the whole thing is about him. The Bible is not some complex, difficult book. It's actually very simple. It's conveying one message from Genesis all the way to Revelation. God's plan of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. It's everywhere. And I'm going to show it to you here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins. Excuse me, I'm skipping down to verse 21. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. So I want to read from Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve sinned, their eyes were opened and they recognized their own nakedness and their own shame. They felt guilty for the mistakes that they had committed. So they hid themselves from God 
and they sewed fig leaves together to try to cover and hide their nakedness. Adam and Eve sewing the fig leaves together is a picture of works-based salvation. This is a picture of how human beings try to compensate by doing good for the wrong that we've done. How many of you know it's human nature when you've done something wrong and you feel guilty? You want to start doing right. You want to pray harder. You want to work harder. You want to donate more to charity to make your conscience feel a little bit better. Is that true? It's human nature. So Adam and Eve sewed these fig leaves together, trying to make themselves righteous, trying to free themselves of their guilt and shame. But the Bible says that the breeze started blowing through the garden and the leaves started rustling and their attempt to cover themselves was null and void. They were exposed. They could, they could not cover themselves for the sin that they had committed. So in verse 21, the Bible says something astounding and it's just one verse. It says that the Lord God himself killed a sin, an, in, an innocent animal to make a covering for them. The Lord, this is the first time we see blood shed in the Bible. This is it. And it's the sacrifice of an innocent animal to provide covering over Adam and Eve's guilt and shame. This is the picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ is the innocent Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world. And it is through Christ that we are covered in his righteousness. We are no longer dependent on our own works, our own effort to be good enough to make it to heaven, to be good enough to rid ourselves of our guilt and shame. No, now we must receive the finished work of Christ and his blood covers us in his righteousness. And now when the Father sees us, he no longer sees us through the lens of our guilt and shame, but now he sees us as blameless, sinless, forgiven, holy, righteous, pure, and true. I wish I get somebody at Vision Church today that would praise his name that he has covered you. This is the picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're in this room today and you're not right with God, you're full of guilt and shame, you're overwhelmed today, I want you to pray and agree with me now. You cannot do anything about your sin or your past. You must receive him by faith. He will wash your sins away and he will cover you in his righteousness. You will not make it to heaven by being a good person because you can never be good enough to outdo the wrong that has been committed in your past. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you do. It's a free gift for sinners who will humble themselves and repent and say, Lord, I need you. Pray with me now. Father, we come to you in Jesus' mighty name. And we repent before you right now. We ask you for forgiveness. We confess to you that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've tried to cover our own shame and our own guilt, but it's left us empty and, and exposed. Nothing can wash away our sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Today, I believe that Christ died on that cross. His blood was spilled to wash my sin away. I believe that he died and three days later was resurrected from the dead in victory and in power. Because he lives, I have the hope of eternal life. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to follow you, love you, and serve you all the days of my life. Help my number one relationship to always be you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, and everybody said amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time or as a recommitment of your life to Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to stand boldly at the count of three. I'm not going to embarrass you, but Scripture tells us that anyone who follows Jesus, you cannot be ashamed of him. You must acknowledge him on earth. If that's you and you committed your life to Christ today, I want you to stand boldly today at the count of three. One, two, three. Three, is there anybody today? I see you, I see you, my sister. God bless you, God bless you. Is there anybody else today that's gonna take that bold step of faith to say, that's me? So proud of you. In just a moment, a member of our prayer team is gonna connect with you and we're gonna walk alongside of you as a church. We love you. And the word says that if just one person would choose Jesus, the angels rejoice in heaven over one person. They're rejoicing over you today. Welcome, we love you. At this time, directly under your seat, there are the elements of communion. 
I want to ask you to go ahead and take the communion elements now at this time. And if you'd stand to your feet. The word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that as often as we meet together, we should do this in remembrance of him. I want to let you know that every Sunday at our prayer corner, right in the back of this sanctuary, there, there are the communion elements that are available for you every Sunday. So if during worship or response, you want to take communion, it's available as often as we meet together. But corporately, we're going to take it once a month, okay? Right now, if you take the bread out, just hold it in your hand. This, our entire service has been for anybody and everybody, believer, unbeliever alike. But this moment right here is only for believers, people who have repented of their sin and given their life to Jesus Christ. Scripture warns that if you eat and drink of this cup in an unworthy fashion, you bring judgment upon yourself. Even as, as Christians, you need to take a moment now to repent before God for any sin that you've committed in your life. Let there be nothing that stands between you and the Father right now. And as we take that bread, I want us to remember that this is the body that was broken for us on Calvary's cross. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ that was broken and beaten beyond recognition for us. Today, we remember that body that was broken so that ours could be made whole. And we receive his sacrifice by faith. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. This time you can partake of the body. And now for the cup. Father, we thank you for the cup of the new covenant, the blood that was shed on our behalf. The blood of Jesus has the power to wash away every sin. And Lord, today we remember the price you paid for us on the cross. Today as we partake of the bread and the cup, it is the symbol that you now live in us and through us. We thank you for the blood. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, you can take of the cup of his blood. Father, we thank you again so much for the sweetness of your spirit, and we thank you for what communion represents, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the blood was shed for our forgiveness. Today, we rejoice in you. We love you and we honor you. Thank you for being a merciful God that while we were dead in our sin, lost in our trespasses, you were rich in mercy towards us. Today, we love you. Live through us. Speak through us today. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. We love you, Vision Church. You're dismissed. Go in peace. Have a wonderful Sunday and bring somebody back with you. And if you consider yourself a part of the Vision family, come at 8.30 or 1130. We love you. We'll see you next week.